Now, if there's a moral to tonight's video, then it's this. Don't mess with strangers, because they're likely to come back and bite you in the ass. Time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends, and listen. Between the sun's departure and return, the silver death had fallen upon Yoros. Its advent, however, had been told in many prophecies, both immemorial and recent. Astrologers had said that this mysterious malady, heretofore unknown on Earth, would descend from the great star, Achenar, which presided balefully over all the lands of the southern continent of Zothik, and having sealed the flesh of a myriad men with its bright metallic pallor, the plague would still go onward in time and space, borne by the dim currents of ether to other worlds. Dire was the Silver Death, and no one knew the secret of its contagion or the cure. Swift as the desert wind, it came into Yoros from the devastated realm of Tarsun, overtaking the very messengers who ran by night to give warning of its nearness. Those who were smitten felt an icy, freezing cold, an instant rigor as if the outermost gulf had breathed upon them. Their faces and bodies whitened strangely, gleaming with a wan luster, and became stiff as long-dead corpses, all in the interim of minutes. In the streets of Silpon and Siloa, and in Farad, the capital of Yoros, the plague passed like an eerie, glittering light from countenance to countenance under the golden lamps, and the victims fell where they were stricken, and the deathly brightness remained upon them. The loud, tumultuous public carnivals were stifled by its passing, and the merrymakers were frozen in frolic attitudes. In proud mansions, the wine-flushed revelers grew pale amid their garish feasts, and reclined in their opulent chairs, still holding the half-empty cups with rigid fingers. Merchants lay in their counting houses on the heap coins they'd begun to reckon, and thieves, entering later, were unable to depart with their booty. Diggers died in the half-completed graves they dug for others, but no one came to dispute their possession. There was no time to flee from the strange, inevitable scourge. Dreadfully and quickly, beneath the clear stars, it breathed upon Yoris, and few were they who awakened from slumber at dawn. Fulbra, the young king of Yoris, who had but newly succeeded to the throne, was virtually a ruler without a people. Fulbra had spent the night of the plague's advent on a high tower of his palace above Farad, an observatory tower equipped with astronomical appliances. A great heaviness had lain on his heart, and his thoughts were dulled with an opiate despair, but sleep was remote from his eyelids. He knew the many predictions that foretold the Silver Death, and moreover, he'd read its imminent coming in the stars, with the aid of the old astrologer and sorcerer, Vemdiz. His latter knowledge he and Vemdiz had not cared to promulgate, knowing full well that the doom of Yoris was a thing decreed from all time by infinite destiny, and that no man could evade the doom, unless it were written that he should die in another way than this. Now Vemdiz had cast the horoscope of Fulbra, and though he found therein certain ambiguities that his science could not resolve, it was nevertheless written plainly that the king would not die in Yoris. Where he would die and in what manner were alike doubtful, but Vemdis, who had served Altaf, the father of Fulbra, and was no less devoted to the new ruler, had wrought by means of his magical art an enchanted ring that would protect Fulbra from the Silver Death in all times and places. The ring was made of a strange red metal, darker than ruddy gold or copper, and was set with a black and oblong gem, not known to terrestrial lapidaries that gave forth eternally a strong, aromatic perfume. The sorcerer told Fulbra never to remove the ring from the middle finger on which he wore it, not even in lands afar from Yoris and in days after the passing of the Silver Death, for if once the plague had breathed upon Fulbra, he would bear its subtle contagion always in his flesh, and the contagion would assume its wanted virulence with the ring's removal. But Vemdiz did not tell the origin of the red metal and the dark gem, nor the price at which the protective magic had been purchased. With a sad heart, 
Fulborough had accepted the ring and had worn it. And so it was that the silver death blew over him in the night and harmed him not. But waiting anxiously on the height tower, and watching the golden lights of Farad rather than the white, implacable stars, he felt a light, passing chillness that belonged not to the summer air. And even as it passed, the gay noises of the city ceased, and the moaning lutes faltered strangely and expired. The stillness crept on the carnival, and some of the lamps went out and were not relit. In the palace beneath him, there was also silence, and he heard no more the laughter of his courtiers and chamberlains. And Vemdiz came not, as was his custom, to join Fulborough on the tower at midnight. So Fulborough knew himself for a realmless king, and the grief that he still felt for the noble altar was swollen by a great sorrow for his perished people. Hour by hour he sat motionless, too sorrowful for tears. The stars changed above him, and Achna glared down perpetually like the bright, cruel eye of a mocking demon, and the heavy balsam of the black jeweled ring arose to his nostrils and seemed to stifle him. And once the thought occurred to Fulbra to cast the ring away and die as his people had died, but his despair was too heavy upon him for even this. And so, at length, the dawn came slowly in heavens as pale as the silver death, and found him still on the tower. In the dawn, King Fulbra rose and descended the coiled stairs of the porphyry into his palace. And midway on the stairs, he saw the fallen corpse of the old sorcerer of Vemdiz, who had died even as he climbed to join his master. The wrinkled face of Vemdiz was like polished metal, and was whiter than his beard and hair. And his open eyes, which had been dark as sapphires, were frosted with the plague. Then... Grieving greatly for the death of Vemdiz, whom he had loved as a foster father, the king went slowly on. And in the suites and halls below, he found the bodies of his courtiers and servants and guardsmen. And none remained alive, excepting three slaves who warded the green, brazen portals of the lower vaults, far beneath the palace. Now Fulbra bethought him of the council of Vemdiz, who had urged him to flee from Yorus and to seek shelter in the southern isle of Sintram, which paid tribute to the kings of Yorus. And though he had no heart for this, nor for any course of action, Fulbra bade the three remaining slaves to gather food and such other supplies as were necessary for a voyage of some length, and to carry them aboard a royal barge of ebony that was moored at the palace porticoes on the river Voom. Then, Embarking with the slaves, he took the helm of the barge and directed the slaves to unfurl the broad amber sail, and past the stately city of Farad, whose streets were thronged with the silvery dead, they sailed on the widening jasper estuary of the Valm, and into the amaranth-coloured gulf of the Induskian Sea. A favourable wind was behind them, blowing from the north over the desolate Tassun and Yorus, even as the silver death had blown in the night. And idly beside them, on the voom, there floated seaward many vessels whose crews and captains had all died of the plague. And Farad was still as a necropolis of old time, and nothing stirred on the estuary shores, excepting the plumy, fan-shapen palms that swayed southward in the freshening wind. And soon the green strand of Yorus receded, gathering to itself the blueness and the dreams of distance. Creaming with a whiny foam, full of strange murmurous voices and vague tales of exotic things, the Halcyon Sea was about the voyagers now, beneath the high-lifting summer sun. But the sea's enchanted voices and its long, languorous, immeasurable cradling could not soothe the sorrow of Fulbra, and in his heart a despair abided, black as the gem that was set in the ring of Vamdi. Albeit he held the great helm of the Ebon barge, and steered as straightly as he could by the sun towards Sintra. The amber sail was taut with the favouring wind, and the barge sped onward all that day, cleaving the amaranth waters with its dark prow that reared in the carved form of an ebony goddess. And when the night came, with the familiar austral stars, Fulbra was able to correct such errors as he'd made in reckoning the course. 
For many days they flew southward, and the sun lowered a little in its circling behind them, and new stars climbed and clustered at evening about the black goddess of the prow. And Fulbra, who had once sailed to the Isle of Simtrum in his boyhood days with his father Altha, thought to see her along the lifting of its shores of camphor and sandalwood from the winey deep. But in his heart there was no gladness, and often now he was blinded by wild tears, remembering that other voyage with Altha. Then, suddenly, and at high noon, there fell an airless cabin, and and the waters became as purple glass about the barge. The sky changed to a dome of beaten copper, arcing close and low, and, as if by some evil wizardry, the dome darkened with untimely night, and a tempest rose like the gathered breath of mighty devils, and shaped the sea into vast ridges and abysmal valleys. The mast of ebony snapped like a reed in the wind, and the sail was torn asunder, and the helpless vessel pitched headlong into the dark troughs and was hurled upward through veils of blinding foam to the giddy summits of the billows. Fulbra clung to the useless helm, and the slaves at his command took shelter in the forward cabin. For countless hours they were borne onward at the will of the mad hurricane, and Fulbra could see naught in the lowering gloom except the pale crests of the beetling waves and he could no longer tell the direction of their course. Then, in that lurid dusk, he beheld at intervals another vessel that rode the storm-driven sea, not far from the barge. He thought that the vessel was a galley such as might be used by merchants that voyaged among the southern isles, trading for incense and plumes and vermilion. But its oars were mostly broken, and the topple mast and sail hung forward on the prow. For a time the ships drove on together, till Fulbra saw, in a rifting of the gloom, the sharp and somber crags of an unknown shore, with sharper towers that lifted palely above them. He could not turn the helm, and the barge and its companion vessel were carried toward the looming rocks, till Fulbra thought that they would crash thereon. But, as if by some enchantment, even as it had risen, the sea fell abruptly in a windless calm and quiet sunlight poured from a clearing sky, and the barge was left on a broad crescent of ochre yellow sand between the crags and the lulling waters, with the galley beside it. Dazed and marvelling, Fulbra leaned on the helm, while his slaves crept timidly forth from the cabin, and men began to appear on the decks of the galley, and the king was about to hail these men, some of whom were dressed as humble sailors, and others in the fashion of rich merchants, but he heard a laughter of strange voices, high and shrill and somehow evil, that seemed to fall from above, and looking up he saw that many people were descending a sort of stairway in the cliffs that enclosed the beach. The people drew near, thronging about the barge and the galley. They wore fantastic turbans of blood red, and were clad in closely fitting robes of vulturine black. Their faces and hands were yellow as saffron, their small and slatty eyes were set obliquely beneath lashless lids, and their thin lips, which smiled eternally, were crooked, crooked as the blades of scimitars. They bore sinister and wicked-looking weapons, in the form of sawtoothed swords and double-headed spears. Some of them bowed low before Fulbra, and addressed him obsequiously, staring upon him all the while with an unblinking gaze that he could not fathom. Their speech was no less alien than their aspect. It was full of sharp and hissing sounds, and neither the king nor his slaves could comprehend it. But Fulbra bespoke the court courteously, in the mild and mellow flowing tongue of Yoros, and inspired the name of his land whereon the barge had been cast by the tempest. Certain of the people seemed to understand him, for a light came in their slatty eyes at his question, and one of them answered brokenly in the language of Yoris, saying that the land was the Isle of Ukastrog. Then, with something of a covert evil in his smile, this person added that all shipwrecked mariners and seafarers would receive a goodly welcome from Ildrak, the king of the isle. At this, the heart of Fulbra sank within him, for he had heard numerous tales of Ukastrog 
in bygone years, when the tales were not such as would reassure a stranded traveller. Bukestroch, which lay far to the east of Sintram, was known commonly as the Isle of the Torturers, and men said that all who landed upon it unaware, or were cast thither by the seas, were imprisoned by the inhabitants, and were subjected later to unending curious tortures, whose infliction formed the chief delight of these cruel beings. No man, it was rumoured, had ever escaped from Ukestroch, but many had lingered for years in its dungeons and hellish torture chambers, kept alive for the pleasure of King Ildrak and his followers. Also it was believed that the torturers were great magicians who could raise mighty storms with their enchantments, and could cause vessels to be carried far from the maritime routes, and then fling them ashore upon Ukestrol. Seeing that the yellow people were all about the barge, and that no escape was possible, Fulbra asked them to take him at once before King Ildrak. To Ildrak he would announce his name and royal rank, and it seemed to him, in his simplicity, that one king, even though cruel-hearted, would scarcely torture another or keep him captive. Also, it might be that the inhabitants of Ukestrog had been somewhat maligned by the tales of travellers. So Fulbra and his slaves were surrounded by certain of the throng and were led toward the palace of Ildrak, whose high, sharp towers crowned the crags beyond the beach, rising above those clustered abodes in which the island people dwelt. And while they were climbing the hewn steps in the cliff, Fulbra heard a loud outcry below and a clashing of steel against steel and looking back he saw that the crew of the stranded galley had drawn their swords and were fighting the islanders. But they were outnumbered greatly, and their resistance was borne down by the swarming torturers, and most of them were taken alive. And Fulbra's heart misgave him sorely at this sight, and more and more did he mistrust the yellow people. Soon he came into the presence of Ildrak, who sat on a lofty brazen chair in a vast hall of the palace. Ildrek was taller by half a head than any of his followers, and his features were like a mask of evil wrought from some pale gilded metal, and he was clad in vestments of a strange hue, like sea purple brightened with fresh flowing blood. About him were many guardsmen, armed with terrible scythe-like weapons, and the sullen slant-eyed girls of the palace, in skirts of vermilion and breast cups of lazuli, went to and fro among huge basaltic columns. About the hall stood numerous engineries of wood and stone and metal, such as Fulbra had never beheld, and having a formidable aspect with their heavy chains, their beds of iron teeth and their cords and their pulleys of fish skin. The young king of Yoros went forward with a royal and fearless bearing, and addressed Ildrak, who sat motionless and eyed him with a level, unwinking gaze. And Fulbra told Ildrak his name and station, and the calamity that had caused him to flee from Yoros, and he mentioned also his urgent desire to reach the Isle of Sintram. It is a long voyage to Sintram, said Ildrak, with a subtle smile. Also, it is not our custom to permit guests to depart without fully having tasted the hospitality of the Isle of Ukestrog. Therefore, King Fulbra, I must beg you to curb your impatience. We have much to show you here, and many diversions to offer. My chamberlains will now conduct you to a room befitting your royal rank. But first I must ask you to leave with me the sword that you carry at your side, for swords are often sharp, and I do not wish my guests to suffer injury by their own hands. So Fulbra's sword was taken from him by one of the palace guardsmen, and a small ruby-hilted dagger that he carried was also removed. Then several of the guards, hemming him in with their scythe weapons, led him from the hall and by many corridors and downward flights of stairs into the soft rock beneath the palace. And he knew not whither his three slaves were taken or what disposition was made of the captured crew of the galley, and soon he passed from the daylight into cavernous halls illumined by sulphur-coloured flames in copper cressets, and all around him, in hidden chambers, he heard the sound of dismal moans and loud, maniacal howlings that seemed to beat and die upon adamantine doors. 
In one of these halls, Fulbro and his guardsmen met a young girl, fairer and less sullen of aspect than the others, and Fulbro thought that the girl smiled upon him compassionately as he went by, and it seemed that she murmured faintly in the language of Yoros, Take heart, King Fulbro, for there is one who would help you. And her words were, apparently, not heeded or understood by the guards, who knew only the harsh and hissing tongue of Ukastrol. After descending many stairs, they came to a ponderous door of bronze, and the door was unlocked by one of the guards, and Fulber was compelled to enter, and the door clanged dolorously behind him. The chamber into which he had been thrust was walled on three sides with the dark stone of the island, and was walled on the fourth with heavy, unbreakable glass. Beyond the glass he saw the blue-green, glimmering waters of the undersea, lit by the hanging cressets of the chamber, and in the waters were great devilfish whose tentacles writhed along the wall, and huge pythonomorphs with fabulous golden coils receding in the gloom, and the floating corpses of men that stared in upon him with eyeballs from which the lids had been excised. There was a couch in one corner of the dungeon, close to the wall of glass, and food and drink had been supplied for Fulbury in vessels of wood. The king laid himself down, weary and hopeless, without tasting the food, and then, lying with close-shut eyes while the dead men and sea monsters peered in upon him by the glare of the cressets, he strove to forget his griefs and the dolorous doom that impended. And through his clouding terror and sorrow, he seemed to see the comely face of the girl who'd smiled upon him with compassion, and who, alone of all he'd met in Ukastrog, had spoken to him with words of kindness. The face returned ever and anon with a soft haunting, a gentle sorcery, and Fulbra felt, for the first time in many suns, the dim stirring of his buried youth and the vague, obscure desire of life. So, after a while, he slept and the face of the girl came still before him in his dreams. The cressets burned above him with undiminished flames when he awakened, and the sea beyond the wall of glass was thronged with the same monsters as before, or with others of like kind. But amid the floating corpses he now beheld the flayed bodies of his own slaves, who, after being tortured by the island people, had been cast forth into the submarine cavern that adjoined his dungeon so that he might see them on awakening. He sickened with new horror at the sight, but even as he stared at the dead faces, the door of bronze swung open with a sullen grinding, and his guards entered. Seeing that he had not consumed the food and water provided for him, they forced him to eat and drink a little, menacing him with their broad, crooked blades till he complied. And then they led him from the dungeon and took him before King Ildrak in the great Hall of Torches. Fulbra saw by the level golden light through the palace windows and the long shadows of the columns and machines of torment that the time was early dawn. The hall was crowded with the torturers and their women, and many seemed to look on while others, of both sexes, busied themselves with ominous preparations. And Fulbra saw that a tall brazen statue with cruel and demonian visage, like some implacable god of the underworld, was now standing at the right hand of Ildrak, where he sat aloft on his brazen chair. Fulbra was thrust forward by his guards, and Ildrak greeted him briefly with a wily smile that preceded the words and lingered after them. And when Ildrak had spoken, the brazen image also began to speak, addressing Fulbra in the language of Yoros, with strident and metallic tones, and telling him with full and minute circumstance the various infernal tortures to which he was to be subjected on that day. When the statue had done speaking, Fulbra heard a soft whisper in his ear, and saw beside him the fair girl whom he'd previously met in nether corridors, in nether it, and saw beside him the fair girl whom he had previously met in the nether corridors, and the girl seemingly unheeded by the torturers, said to him, Be courageous, and endure bravely all that is inflicted, for I shall effect your release before another day, if this be possible. Fulbra was cheered by the girl's assurance, 
and it seemed to him that she was fairer to look upon than before. And he thought that her eyes regarded him tenderly, and the twin desires of love and life were strangely resurrected in his heart to fortify him against the tortures of Ildra. Of that which was done to Fulbra for the wicked pleasure of King Ildrak and his people, it were not well to speak fully. For the islanders of Ukastrog had designed innumerable torments, curious and subtle, wherewith to harry and extricate the five senses, and they would harry the brain itself, driving it to extremes more terrible than madness, and could take away the dearest treasures of memory and leave unutterable foulness in their place. On that day, however, they did not torture Fulbra to the uttermost, but they racked his ears with cacophonous sounds, with evil flutes that chilled the blood and curdled it upon his heart, with deep drums that seemed to ache in all of his tissues, and thin tabors that wrenched his very bones. They then compelled him to breathe the mounting fumes of braziers wherein the dry gall of dragons and the adipocry of dead cannibals were burned together with fetid wood. Then, when the fire had died down, they freshened it with the oil of vampire bats and Fulbra swooned, unable to bear the fetter any longer. Later they stripped away his kingly vestments and fastened about his body a silken girdle that had been freshly dipped in acid corrosive only to human flesh, and the acid ate slowly, fretting his skin with infinite pang. Then, after removing the girdle lest it slay him, the torch was brought in certain creatures that had the shape of elong serpents, but were covered from head to tail with sable hairs like those of a caterpillar. And these creatures twined themselves tightly about the arms and legs of Fulbra, and though he fought wildly in his revulsion, he could not loosen them with his hands, and the hairs that covered their constringent coils began to pierce his limbs like a million tiny needles, till he screamed with agony. And when his breath failed him, and he could no longer scream, the baby serpents were induced to relinquish their hold by a languorous piping of which the islanders knew the secret. They dropped away and left him, but the mark of their coils was imprinted readily about his limbs, and around his body there burned the raw branding of the girdle. King Ildrak and his people looked on with a dreadful gloating for in such things they took their joy, and strove to pacify an implacable, obscure desire. But seeing now that Fulbra could endure no more, and wishing to wreak their will upon him for many future days, they took him back to his dungeon. Lying sick with remembered horror, feverish with pain, he longed not for the clemency of death, but hoped for the coming of the girl to release him as she had promised. The long hours passed with a half-delirious tedium, and the cressets, whose flames had been changed to crimson, appeared to fill his eyes with flowing blood, and the dead man and the sea monsters swam as if in blood, beyond the wall of glass. And the girl came not, and Fulbra had begun to despair. Then, at last, he heard the door open gently, and not with the harsh clangor that had proclaimed the entrance of his guard. Turning, he saw the girl, who stole swiftly to his couch with a lifted fingertip, enjoining silence. She told him with soft whispers that her plan had failed, but surely on the following night she would be able to drug the guards and obtain the keys to the outer gates, and Fulbra could escape from the palace to a hidden cove in which a boat with water and provisions lay ready for his use. She prayed him to endure for another day the torments of Ildrak, and to this, perforce, he consented, and he thought that the girl loved him, for tenderly she caressed his feverous brow, and rubbed his torturous burning limbs with a soothing ointment. He deemed that her eyes were soft with a compassion that was more than pity, and so Fulbra believed the girl and trusted her, and took heart against the horror of the coming day. Her name, it seemed, was Ilva and her mother was a woman of Yoros who had married one of the evil islanders, choosing this repugnant union as an alternative to the flaying knives of Ildrak. Too soon the girl went away, pleading the great danger of discovery, and closed the door softly upon Fulbra. 
and after a while the king slept, and Ilvar returned to him amid the delirious abominations of his dreams, and sustained him against the terror of strange hells. At dawn the guards came with their hooked weapons, and led him again before Ildrak, and again the brazen demonic statue, in a strident voice, announced the fearful ordeals that he was to undergo. And this time he saw that other captives, including the crew and merchants of the galley, were also awaiting the malefic ministrations of the torturers in the vast hall. Once more in the throng of watchers, the girl Ilvar pressed close to him, unreprimanded by his guards, and murmured words of comfort, so that Fulbra was enheartened against the enormities foretold by the brazen oracular image, and indeed a bold and hopeful heart was required to endure the ordeals of that day. Among other things less goodly to be mentioned, the torturers held before Fulbra a mirror of strange wizardry, wherein his own face was reflected as if seen after death. The rigid features, as he gazed upon them, became marked with the green and bluish marbling of corruption, and the withering flesh fell in on the sharp bones and displayed the visible fretting of the worm. Hearing meanwhile the dolorous groans and agonizing cries of his fellow captives all about the hall, he beheld other faces, dead, swollen, lidless and flayed, that seemed to approach him from behind and to throng about his own face in the mirror. Their looks were dank and dripping, like the hair of corpses recovered from the sea, and seaweed was mingled within the locks. Then, turning at a cold and clammy touch, he found that these faces were no illusion but the actual reflection of cadavers drawn from under sea by a malign sorcery that had entered the hall of Ildrak like living men and were peering over his shoulder. His own slaves, with flesh that the sea things had gnawn even to the bone, were among them, and the slaves came toward him with glaring eyes that saw only the voidness of death. And beneath the sorcerous control of Ildrak, their evilly animated corpses began to assail Fulbra, clawing at his face and raiment with half-eaten fingers. And Fulbra, faint with loathing, struggled against his dead slaves, who knew not the voice of their master, and were as deaf as the wheels and racks of torment used by Ildrak. Anon, the drowned and dripping corpses went away, and Fulbra was stripped by the torturers and was laid supine on the palace floor, with iron rings that bound him closely to the flags at knee and wrist, at elbow and ankle. Then they brought in the disinterred body of a woman, nearly eaten, in which a myriad maggots swarmed on the uncovered bones and tatters of dark corruption, and this body they placed on the right hand of Fulbra. And also they fetched the carrion of a black goat that was nearly touched with beginning decay, and they laid it beside him on the left hand. Then, the cross Fulbra, from right to left, the hungry maggots crawled in a long and undulant wave. After the consummation of this torture, there came many others that were equally ingenious and atrocious, and were well designed for the delectation of King Ildrak and his people. And Fulbra endured the tortures valiantly, upheld by the thought of Ilva. Vainly, however, on the night that followed this day, he waited in his dungeon for the girl. The cressets burned with a bloodier crimson, and new corpses were among the flayed and floating dead in the sea cavern, and strange double-bodied serpents on the nether deep arose with an endless squirming, and their horned heads appeared to bloat immeasurably against the crystal wall. And yet the girl Ilva came not to free him as she had promised, and the night passed. But though despair resumed its old dominion in the heart of Fulbra, and terror came with talons steeped in fresh venom, he refused to doubt Ilva, telling himself that she had been delayed or prevented by some unforeseen mishap. At the dawn of the third day, he was again taken before Ildra. The brazen image announcing the ordeals of the day told him that he was to be bound on a wheel of adamant, and, lying on the wheel, was to drink a drugged wine that would steal away his royal memories forever, and would conduct his naked soul on a long pilgrimage through monstrous and infamous hells, before bringing it back to the hall of Ildrak and the broken body on the wheel. 
Then certain women of the torturers, laughing obscenely, came forward and bound King Fulbra to the adamantine wheel with thongs of dragon guts. And after they'd done this, the girl Ilva, smiling with the shameless exultation of Alpum cruelty, appeared before Fulbra and stood close beside him, holding a golden cup that contained the drugged wine. She mocked him for his folly and credulity in trusting her promises, and the other women and the male torturers, even to Ildrak on his brazen seat, laughed loudly and evilly at Fulbra, and praised Ilva for the perfidy she'd practiced upon him. So Fulbra's heart grew sick with a darker despair than any he had yet known. The brief, piteous love that had been born amid sorrow and agony perished within him, leaving but ashes steeped in gall. And yet gazing at Ilva with sad eyes, he uttered no word of reproach. He wished to live no longer, and yearning for a swift death, he bethought him of the wizard ring of Vemdis, and of that which Vemdis had said would follow its removal from his finger. He still wore the ring, which the torturers had deemed a bauble of small value, but his hands were bound tightly to the wheel, and he could not remove it. So, with a bitter cunning, knowing full well that the islanders would not take away the ring if he should offer it to them, he feigned a sudden madness and cried wildly, Steal my memories, if you will, with your accursed wine, and send me through a thousand hells and bring me back again to Ukastrog. But take not the ring which I wear on my middle finger, for it is more precious to me than many kingdoms or the pale breasts of love. Well, hearing this, King Ildrak rose from his brazen seat, and bidding Ilvar to delay the administration of the wine, he came forward and inspected curiously the ring of Vemdis, which gleamed darkly, set with its rayless gem on Fulbra's finger. And all the while Fulbra cried out against him in a frenzy, as if fearing that he would take the ring. So Ildrak deeming that he could plague the prisoner thereby and could heighten his suffering a little, did the very thing for which Fulbra had planned. And the ring came easily from the shrunken finger, and Ildrak, wishing to mock the royal captive, placed it on his own middle digit. Then, while Ildrak regarded the captive with a more deeply graven smile of evil on the pale, gilded mask of his face, there came to King Fulbra of Eurus the dreadful and longed-for thing, the Silver Death, that had slept so long in his body beneath the magical abeyance of the Ring of Vemdes, was made manifest even as he hung on the adamantine wheel. His limbs stiffened with another rigour than that of agony, and his face shone brightly with the coming of the death, and so he died. Then, to Ilvar and to many of the torturers who stood wondering about the wheel, the chill and instant contagion of the Silver Death was communicated. They fell even where they'd stood, and the pestilence remained like a glittering light on the faces and the hands of the men, and shone forth from the nude bodies of the women. And the plague passed along the immense hall, and the other captives of King Ildrak were released thereby from their various torments, and the torturers found surcease from the dire longing that they could assuage only through the pain of their fellow men. And through all the palace, and throughout the Isle of Ukastro, the death fell swiftly, visible in those upon whom it had breathed, but otherwise unseen and impalpable. But Ilrak, wearing the ring of Vemdes, was immune, and guessing not the reason for his immunity, he beheld with consternation the doom that had overtaken his followers, and watched in stupefaction the freeing of his victims. Then, fearful of some inimic sorcery, he rushed from the hall, and standing in the early sun on a palace terrace above the sea, he tore the ring of Vemdes from his finger and hurled it to the foamy billows far below, deeming in his terror that the ring was perhaps the source or agent of the unknown hostile magic. And so Ildrak... In his turn, when all the others had fallen, was smitten by the Silver Death, and its peace descended upon him where he lay in his robes of blood-bright and purple, with features shining palely 
to the unclouded sun, and oblivion claimed the Isle of Ogestrog, and the torturers were one with the torture. Oh man, there is no school like the old school. Another old time classic there from, well, I don't know where, back in the day. <laughs> Hope you're all doing well. Uh, coronavirus lockdown is in full effect still. So if you're listening to this from the future, you do not know what you're missing. Well, I hope you don't because this is not the best of times. We're all at home trying to get through this. Um, bit low on morale, bit low on money, but we're doing our best. And you from the future, yeah, you think it's all fun and games, don't you? But, well, life can be about more important things. So go out there, hug your friends, your relatives, and just let them know that you love them, okay? Might sound silly, but really, it is more important than you realize right now. For those of you living in the moment, well, hope you're hanging in there. I'm doing my best to keep you entertained in these difficult times. Well, it is enough for me for one night, but I'll be back again very, very soon with uh, lots more entertainment to help you through these boring, boring times at home. <laughs> Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.